uh, Central European time. So I guess we start our uh, webinar. This is a webinar about hybrid events and it's organized by talent team. And usually a uh, talent team has, we have these Wednesday sessions and the last um, Wednesday of the month is the time when we have more serious talk, is our business talk um, meeting. This time we had this um, great opportunity to have Mr. Matthias Bauer to uh, speak here about hybrid events. And we thought it was so interesting and exciting that we decided to open this opportunity for everybody in IFES to come to listen uh, this webinar. So uh, before we start, um, we do so that uh, you might have some questions and hopefully have some questions. Please use the um, chat for the questions. So whenever you have a question about anything that will be presented, write your question to the chat and we will go them through one by one after the presentation is over. So uh, meaning that while uh, this presentation goes that we don't then we keep our mi mics muted and listen uh, and we discuss in the second half of the um, webinar time. So now uh, I give the stage to Mr. Matthias Bauer, please. <laughs> um, educate and teach us about the future events and how the hybrid events, what kind of events hybrid events might be and if there will and how we can create some business also for the service providers in this new normal we are living. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and um, thanks for inviting me and also hello to um, everybody. And um, first of all, before I start, actually most people um, uh, call me Tesi and not Matthias. So normally um, the only person who calls me Matthias is my father. And when he calls me Matthias, I know that I have done something badly. So please uh, feel free to call me Matthias or Tesi as you want. Um, yeah, as I said, thank you very much for being invited um, to this great um, panel or to this great online session. Um, I want to give you in the next 20-25 uh, minutes a little bit an update about the exhibition think tank and about hybrid events, what we did in the past. And if you have any questions or any discussion, if you agree, if you disagree, if you don't understand, whatever you want to say, um, please put it in the chat or ask me after the slides. I also I gave this presentation in an UFI um, session, in an UFI Connect session um, around two weeks ago and also in a um, conference that was specifically organized for the Thailand industry. Um, and people were quite engaged in both sessions and we had quite of, a couple of controversial discussions after that. So let's see how active um, this group is. Okay, let's start. Um, what we, or let's start um, first of all with, with a little bit about my background, as you can see, and as you can hear, maybe I'm German, I'm living in London, uh, but originally I come from Germany, from the beautiful city of Darmstadt, um, south of Frankfurt, who can't locate it on the map. I started at Messe Frankfurt, but then I worked practically my entire, or I grew up at Reed Exhibitions. The first six years as e-business director in Düsseldorf, responsible for Germany and Switzerland in terms of e-business questions. And then I moved to London, where I'm still today, where I'm global e-business director for a while, but then became um, director for business development with a big focus on China in the year 2010 and 2012. Then I moved to UBM, a company that is not uh, that doesn't exist anymore, but all the UBM people are still around because Informa took over. And I was running the global food portfolio of UBM with 12 trade shows around the world and 25 conferences with teams in many, many different markets, which was an absolutely great experience. And since um, 2015, since five years, I'm running my own consulting company, um, MBB Consulting Group, and I was engaged in UFI. I was engaged in Alma, and I teach at the university for one week per year, so not very often in Ravensburg in Germany. And this is what my company is doing. Our main job is actually really consulting work. We do consulting in strategy, in M&A, in due diligence, 
in digital, um, we do strategy consulting on a show level, on a portfolio level, or on a company level. We have customers around the world. Um, we have an education arm. Um, we give education courses. We run workshops. Um, just last week in Munich, I was running a workshop. And we have a partnership with UFI. And we run, we co-run and co-manage together with UFI the Exhibition Management School, which actually started um, last week for the first time. And we have the Exhibition Think Tank Club. And the Exhibition Think Tank Club is actually a true baby of the corona crisis. How it came up with the Exhibition Think Tank Club was that we released a crisis recovery guide in April, May time. So we were sitting, all trade shows have been cancelled, our clients called us and cancelled all projects, so suddenly we were sitting at our desks, we had a lot of time um, because everybody was in a kind of a shock, shock state and we released the crisis recovery guide. And in the crisis recovery guide, we already talked in April, May, a little bit about what is a post-crisis USP, which type of sales team do you need, in how do you judge in which phase of the crisis you are. And we sent this as a free of charge service to all our network and to all our clients um, worldwide. And as a consequence of that, we had 40, 50 calls with teams from all around the world. We had a call with a team in Sydney. We had calls with people in New York, with people in Germany, in UK. And at this time, everybody independently, if big company, supplier, small company, everybody from the industry really asked themselves the question, how will business life continue? What should we do? And what will the future be of the crisis? So we came up with the idea to start a think tank. It was planned as a one-off exercise. I saw one person uh, on this call who joined the think tank, Hello Carla from this point of view, and we said, okay, we need to do a think tank and we need to discuss how we shape the future of the exhibition industry. Overall, 150 people from all around the world joined and we divided the 150 people into 20 working groups and we exercised something that never happened before in the industry. We assembled and we created a concept for a crowd intelligence process by jumping through different universes. We asked the entire industry with surveys, so we sent out emails to 6,000 people and said, please fill in the survey. Then we had the think tank with 150 people where we presented the results and then we split up in smaller units in the working groups, which were only five to seven people. So we were permanently changing the scenery and the group of audience to discuss in four sprints which areas need to define and uh, need to change in the industry starting in May. Then in the second sprint, what exactly needs to change in every area? In the third sprint, how would a solution look for the customer? And in the last sprint that was ending end of June, um, how should we deliver the, 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 the area? When we started this whole exercise, I truly had no idea what the outcome is. I truly had no idea will be the outcome that we can't use, will be the outcome something that is super, super interesting, or will be the outcome on such a high level that nobody can apply it. And the outcome was absolutely amazing and, and, and truly mind, mind boggling actually in my point of view. And here I show you a preparation slide when we asked the entire industry um, which, which areas need to change. And we had uh, answers from all over the world. We had a focus topic clearly in Europe, but also in Europe, we had a good diversity across the major countries of Europe. And that was one result. I found a remarkable insight in its own right. So in May, we asked, how much do you think our industry needs to change? Zero percent said, we can stay as we are. It's all perfect. Hey, guys, it's just a crisis. Let's stay as you are. We don't need to change. Crisis will be over. 5% said we need to change a little bit and more than uh, 95% 95 is actually we have to change. We have to change a lot 
or even we have to change completely. And when you let this result sink in a little bit is have a think about what is the nature of the crisis. We're talking about a health and safety crisis. We're talking about a virus. So a logical answer would be we need to set up, we need to change the setup of the show. We need to go to our stand builders and say, build us bigger stands with, with more space for more social distancing. But that was not only the answer. The answer was we really have to change a lot or completely or somewhat, which indicates extremely strongly, and that came out in the think tank, that we had challenges before the crisis, digital, diversity, next generation, and we didn't take these challenges serious enough we had before the crisis, because otherwise this 95% would be a slower area. And here I have a question for you, and if you want, um, write your answer in the chat. Um, how many areas do you think has the think tank collectively identified that needs to change in our industry? So we asked in the survey, we asked in the think tank, which area needs to change? And that could be an area like the setup of the show, digital, people. It could be an area of the location. So we asked an open question, how many areas need to change in our industry? And it could be 11 areas, it could be 22 areas, or it could be 33 areas. And the answer is it was 33 areas. So we identified 33 areas in our industry that we need to work on because the area is not as good as it should be to meet the needs of the future of our customers, of our target groups. And these are all the areas the think tank has identified, this slide and this slide. And after going through this exercise, and again, we asked the entire industry, we asked the think tanks and we discussed it in the breakout groups. Um, after we identified these areas, we were able to group them into main groups like value proposition and subgroups or like the setup of the show, which is very important for stand builders um, or other areas like the commercial strategy. Digital was for sure an area that was expected, but other areas popped up we haven't thought about at the beginning. To be very honest, at the beginning, we didn't give value proposition as one area that needs to change because it was a health and safety crisis. During the think tank, value proposition came up as an absolutely dominant area we really need to work on in future to meet the future needs of our target groups. Other areas were unexpected as well for HR, salaries and benefits, but there were points made during the think tank which are absolutely valid. If we want to be more robust or if we want to have a robust approach to future crisis, we need to have a bigger diversity in our teams. We need to have bigger, we have to have more diverse opinions. We have to have more skills. How good would it be to have hybrid skills as we move into a hybrid event area? So that was really pointed out at things that were missing in our industry in the past. And that is also, by the way, the reason why I really love that we give young people a platform to speak up. We had an Italian student group in the think tank and we have now a French student group in the think tank. And these young people gave also the most valuable insight because they really see how the future is, um, is coming or, or look, uh, look like. So then we gave every area an important score and the important score is a calculation by the important score, the people who mentioned this area, which is the red line, then the percentage of the people who mentioned that area, which is in terms of value proposition, for example, 91%, and then the calculation of this factor by this factor comes to the overall important score, which is in that case 8.1. We have other examples, for, for example, um, here it's uh, content and features uh, was also mentioned by many people, but the overall important score from the people who mentioned it were lower, so that comes up with a lower important score. Or marketing and communication 
mentioned only by a couple of people, but the people who mentioned this area gave it a very high importance score, which comes to an overall importance score in that case of only 1.5 because only a few people have mentioned this area. So that gives us an extremely good framework and an extremely good, good picture in which shape our industry is and on which areas we need to work on. And as you can see, we will not be bored in the next weeks to come. So we have a little bit of, of, of something to do. I want to focus on one topic of the, of the four most dominant topics. And the four most dominant topics are value proposition. I already thought that and there is a concern that we might not have the right value proposition or that we really need to work on the value proposition. And this is something where obviously the suppliers play an, a, a great role and, and can really contribute. Them. There's another concern about pricing, that our pricing is not understood, our pricing is maybe perceived too expensive, and our pricing is harder to argue and therefore harder to sell the products. Then supporting people, I already said this, and hybrid events, and I want to drill a little bit down into hybrid events um, in the following slides. What was also important is now that not one single area can be seen isolated. So if you say, I want to build a better product in the future, you can't go with exactly the same pricing and work on the value proposition. If you don't get the pricing right, you can't argue the value proposition. You can't go in a value proposition, but having non-diverse people and not having enough skills on your team. So you need to invest more in people and you need to define an understanding of what a hybrid event is. So let's drill down a little bit deeper into the topic hybrid events. We did, as a when the first think tank was over, I think what I didn't mention so far is we turned the think tank into a think tank club now. So the think tank is not a one-off exercise anymore. We have a think tank club. It's available on um, www.exhibitionthinktank.com. You can sign up for free. The basic membership is for free. We also have a membership that costs 10 pounds a month where you have access to the reports. But you can join for free and everybody is welcome to join. And in this think tank club, after the first think tank, we did a summer sprint. And in the summer sprint, we looked for, um, for the best hybrid event. And what we also used in the summer sprint, uh, my consulting company, we released a report. Um, what is a definition and what is a framework of an hybrid event? And in the summer sprint, we use this framework, we are selling this report, but I want to show you a couple of, of slides out of this report of what is actually a hybrid event, what is a hybrid trade show. And the first, we want to start with the definition. We all have a definition of what a trade show is. Yeah, we, we know what a trade show is. It's when I go to Nini or when I go to Alina and I would say, hey, let's go to a trade show. Alina would not say, hold on, what do you exactly mean with a trade show? Can you define this for me? Yeah, we have a good understanding what a trade show is. We do not have an understanding of uh, what a hybrid event is. And it's very important that we have this common understanding so that we can understand each other and that we can develop it because otherwise we all would develop stuff into different directions. So here comes our definition of what a hybrid event is, feel free to agree or to disagree with, this is how we define a hybrid event. And we base the definition on three pillars. The first is how we use digital. The second is the expansion of the term trade show. So a change and involvement of what we actually mean when we talk about the trade show. And the third pillar is what is the balance me and Nini, we talked about this briefly before we started this session. It's actually the balance of how much do we focus on the live events, on the on-site events, and how much do we focus on the online aspects. So the first pillar is, what is the difference how we need to see digital tools? And first, I want to show you how the industry and how we have developed digital tools in the past and what the change is to the hybrid definition. In the past, we also we developed 
great digital tools. We developed, we had great digital projects. The industry is always behind in digital, but we had really light tower projects in the industry to do great registrations, to do great hall plans, to do great stand building configurator, to do great matchmaking systems. But everything we did was focused on enhancing the USP of the trade show itself. And the USP came only to life and the benefit came only to life through the trade show. And all digital tools were only designed to make this trade show better. In a hybrid model, we need to change this mindset. And here we need to develop digital tools that can carry a benefit also independently, but better together with the trade show. And I have chosen my words here very, very wisely because it means nothing else that if, for example, we develop a matchmaking tool, then the USP promise and the USP benefit is you can use my digital tool and you can have a benefit out of it even if you would not come to the show. However, you will enjoy the whole benefit and you will enjoy the whole USP if you come to the show. But we promise something to people who can't come to our show, but we promise them more when they can come to the show. There are two positive things in it. The one thing is we reach a much wider target group. We reach people who can't come to the show because they're not allowed to travel, they're restricted to travel, they might be too junior to travel, they might be too senior or too busy to travel. So we reach a whole, whole new target group by doing it so. And the other positive element is we are really wide in the USP of our trade show. And I come to the balance in, in a sec. So that is really a paradigm, a, a change of paradigm, how we need to develop digital tools. And it's a new way of thinking. That was pillar number one. Pillar number one is what do we mean actually when we talk about the trade show? And in the past, I just used the word, I go to Alina and I said, let's meet at the trade show. And she said, what do you mean with the trade show? Do you mean we meet in a conference or do you mean this? Do you mean that? No, it was relatively clear what I mean. So we had the trade show, the trade show where the opening day, when the show is open and we have to physically go there and we have to meet somewhere at the trade show. And before we had the preparation time and then we had the post show time and we tried to offer services in this time, but the trade show was only this time. In future, it would be extremely helpful when we talk about the trade show that we mean something totally different, that we mean all services we offer and that can happen, that can execute it in the time when we offer hybrid digital and hybrid on-site services and products which means the time before the trade show and the time after the trade show becomes a part of the trade show. They are only delivered and they're only brought to life through different formats, but they are a part of the trade show, which again carries a positive message because our trade show is not three days anymore. Our trade show can be three months or can be 10 months, depending which services we then. Changing this meaning of what a trade show means is actually relatively hard. When I wrote the presentation, I was always falling back into the trap that I talked about trade shows. And in my mind, I was thinking about the three days when the trade show is open. So that is really a mind shift. And now comes the last bit is what is the balance of where, how do we bring the USP to life? Where do we offer the services? And here I don't step back, but I clarify, whilst we're talking about a much wider definition when we talk about trade shows, the absolutely dominant focus on service, on USP, on products is on the on-site days. And I say it must be 75% because there is nothing above face-to-face. You only can, when you do want to do business, you need to build trust and you build trust when you look each other into the eyes. Or like Nini said, we can't wait that the time is over. When I was just in Munich last week and I was sitting down with my client, we all said 
it is so great to sit in one room again. Our discussions are deeper, our trust is deeper, our outcome is better, our results are better. So we should be extremely proud of our product and we should be extremely confident that trade shows are that platform to make business. However, it does not liberate us not to do anything before or after. We still have the duty to add services, which also be matchmaking, bringing people together, offering benefits to people, even if they can't come to our trade show. But as I said, if they come to the trade show, they get the full benefit. So this balance definition is also very important. That is the definition of what is actually in a hybrid event. And as I said, that is the definition of MBB consulting. Feel free to make it better if you want. We are all in this together. And any thoughts, um, here's my email address. Send them to us. They are more than welcome. So now we come to the framework of what is actually in a hybrid event. And we started this framework by comparing a little bit the old world with the new world. And the old world was, let's say I'm an exhibitor, and let's say, because I will give you an example about this, let's say I'm a German wine producer. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm producing 100,000 bottles of wine every year, and I want that my wine is sold in France and in England. What would I have done in the past? I would go to the wine trade show in London, and I would, have go, would go to the wine trade show in Bordeaux. There are great wine trade shows in these two cities. I would book a stand because I'm a small company. I would book a very small stand, nine square meters. Hopefully stand building is not too expensive and offer my wine and hope that a lot of shop owners passing my, my stand and, 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 and buy my wine for their shops. And this, it, this didn't exist at this point in time. It still now exists a little bit, but most trade shows are not happening at the moment. So then we were thinking, okay, which online channels do exist? I'm still the German wine producer. I still have my wine. I can't go to a trade show anymore. What can I do? So here we were listing all channels, a blog, a video, webinar, one-to-one -one meetings, a panel discussion, what we do at the moment a little bit, reviews, virtual stands, directories, sponsorship, and so on. And then we start grouping them into main topics. The main, first pocket or the middle pocket is networking communication, the main motivation why I actually go to a trade show. Then one pocket is more content and resources, and another pocket is brand and product presence. So I already know if I want to do more networking, I should maybe use these online channels. If I want to do brand building, I more should use these online channels. And then we went one step further and we create this slide. And that slide looks horrible, but it's relatively easy to read. So here we said, okay, we have our three main pockets, content and resources with all online channels, networking and communication with all online channels, brand building and product awareness, again, with all online channels that exist. Then we listed here in the horizontal line all exhibitor motivations. So what are the exhibitor motivations? They have want to do prospect engagement, availability, ease of execute if they are a small company. So they can't afford, they don't have a digital team. It must be easy. They want to do lead generation, brand building, customer relationship. They want to have a wide reach, product exposure, targeting prospects, cost effectiveness or they want to offer things in different languages because they might come from Germany and want to offer something in England, or they might come from Italy and want to offer something in Asia, or whatever. And then we rated every online channel versus every exhibitor motivation and said how good or not good is serving this channel, this exhibitor motivation. The blogs, for example, they don't serve prospect engagement very well because you put them online, then they are online, they are online forever. You hope that people find it and then they are there. But they are working, the reach is quite good with blogs or the product exposure is quite good with blogs. And other things, for example, brand building, let's have a look what is really good for brand building. Webinars, specifically the own webinars because you can do them however you want to do them. Or for product exposure, reviews is good. Sure, when you book a hotel in another, and they have a good review, then you book it. 
and so on and so on. So what you can do with the slide, you see it's actually not so hard to read. You can say, if you're an exhibitor or if you're a trade show organizer, you can say in the past I've done blogs, I've done matchmaking, I've done directories. For what is that actually good, what I've done in the past? Or you can do it the other way around. You can say, I built my hybrid strategy now. So I'm now sitting down and think, hey, I actually, I would like to give my exhibitors good brand building tools or good customer re relation management tools. Then I need to go into this online channel. So this is the framework and you can use, and now you can for the first time rate how good or how less good a hybrid trade show actually is. So let me give you some examples how that can work in real life. And we scanned by now, I think 50 shows. We are just releasing a report specifically for the food industry. And it is actually really mind opening when you see how different trade shows um, go with, with this framework we developed. So with CIAL, and here we only show positive results as an example. We don't show negative results we don't, because we don't want to talk negative about any colleague from the industry. But you will see that there are examples when trade shows practically don't do something. CIAL in Paris, they found an answer in September. We just reviewed it and for sure we heard the news about Composium. From Exposium, but they offer tools in all three major pockets, content and resources, networking and communication, brand building. So they give a wide variety to their exhibitors to bring the product to life. Uh, another show, they focus obviously very strong on the networking pocket and a little bit on the brand building pocket. And again, another show, they have less tools overall, but, uh, but still enough tools and they have also a wide variety over the song. Then we found trade shows who only offer sponsorship, then we found trade shows who are really focusing on networking and so on. And when you scan a wide uh, range of, of, of these websites, you see that the concept and the understanding what is an online tool and what is a hybrid model is at the moment really, really different in our industry. And at the end of the day, I want to show you one best practice example we have found in the summer sprint at the exhibition Think Tank Club when we said find the best hybrid event. But before I show you this, I want to finish a little bit my example. And that also demonstrates, um, I said on a slide earlier, we should be proud of our trade shows. We should be proud of our platforms. However, that does not liberate us from the thinking to find also good online solutions. And how we are not liberated from developing our great trade shows into great hybrid trade shows with a 75% focus on the trade show itself. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about a self-experiment I did. I was really playing that I'm a wine producer from Germany. I'm not a wine producer, I'm a consultant. But I played the role of a wine producer for one month. And I said, oh, I could go to a trade show, a nine square meter booth with traveling and with team traveling and with all on-site engagement cost me something between 5,000 and 12,000 US dollars. And that is actually swallowing up a big, big chunk of my annual marketing budget to go to the trade show. So why don't I try to find some leads on Facebook. Because the trade show is also six months away, I still want to find some shops in London who trade my wine. So why do I not try to go on Facebook and try to find some leads? So I asked my um, IT guy in my team, set me up a, trade, uh, a Facebook campaign to find specifically shop owners, not wine lovers, shop owners, who want to trade my German wine in their London shops. And we did it. It was not easy. It was really hard because Facebook is not designed to find B2B leads, but we applied two techniques. We applied the double targeting methodology, which is a technique you can apply in Facebook. 
and then we applied a look-alike campaign, which actually is the technology with which Trump won the election four years ago, by saying, I found a person, and now I target persons who look very much like the person I found. And with applying these two technologies and overcoming a couple of hurdles, because Facebook is not designed for B2B, I spent 50 pounds and I found seven strong leads of shop owners who want to sell my wine. 50 pounds. Think about this. If I'm now really the German wine owner and somebody's coming to me and said, hey, you can spend $10,000 and then you're in trade show. That is in six months. So you have six months to be happy about it. Yeah. And then 30% of your marketing budget is followed up. Is that not great? Or a person is coming and said, hey, you can pay 1% of it, 50 pounds. You don't have to wait six months. You find the leads next week. You only need somebody on your team who is skilled enough to use Facebook or to LinkedIn. What do you think is this person choice is? Will he wait six months to spend 10,000 to get maybe 50 to 100 leads? Or will this person spend now 50 pounds, 1% of that money to get the leads immediately? And there were good leads. By the way, in the experiment, I had to call these seven shops and said, by the way, I'm not a wine producer. That was just an experiment. I do apologize for what I have done. But this experiment shows how urgent it is that we move into hybrid events and that we have a diverse group of people who are helping us as an industry to push that forward. So a great result from the exhibition Think Tank Club. And here's a best practice example. And then I stop sharing my slides and um, we can discuss if you have any questions. If you don't have any questions, we can finish that, that meeting earlier. Um, so here in that best practice, you can see, first of all, we applied um, our framework to this trade show called Pop wine. That was one of the breakout groups. And we found four best practice cases. How many best practice cases would you think came from a trade show organizer? We found four best practice cases of hybrid events. How many came from a trade show organizer? One. Only one came from a trade show organizer. One, and this is this one, Hop Wine. They have not been engaged in the exhibition industry at all beforehand. And two came actually from companies who should be exhibitors. From Oracle, no, sorry, from Cisco and from Apple. So big exhibiting companies producing now their own hybrid events. Yeah. Why are we in a stronger position to do it ourselves? Because we still have the trade shows. We have this asset, the trade show itself. However, this is an example from somebody who has not been in the exhibition industry beforehand. And when you are on their website, you will see then they are also called their customers exhibitors. They mean something totally different than we, when we talk about exhibitors. And what they are doing actually is they are collecting products, in that case in the wine industry, but it would use in all other in, it would work in all under in other industries as well. They collect wine samples from France, small bottles. Then they package them up in packages of six bottles. Then they ship the samples to high valuable buyer. And then they run online events to present the products in a true hybrid setup because you're online but you also have the product on your desk to taste it. So they bring six products from six different stands onto the desk of premium buyers. And that is a business model. They work and they work very, very successfully. What they don't have, if we would do something similar, but what they don't have, they would not have a real trade show at the moment. So if we do that, we could provide exactly the same value, but then we could say, and we have this trade show and we have this industry gathering where you can see so much more, where you can see industry trends, where you can meet your customers face to face and so on. But very, very impressive best practice example. 
so far our definition, our framework and our best practice examples about hybrid trade shows. Before I end my discussion, just very quickly is, as I said, the exhibition think tank is a club now. We do ongoing think tanks. We start our next think tank actually next Monday. We do, we have working groups. We have a working group, or, you know, we have a focus topic for suppliers. So if you're a supplier and you want to engage and you want to add your insights to the exhibition think tank, please sign up. And we release a lot of reports and white papers. And our next two sessions are next Monday. We start a think tank discovering new trade show customer touch points. And the thinking behind that think tank is if it's true that we move into the hybrid sphere, that also means we have new touch points. And in this think tank, we want to discover what are these new touch points to our customers. That was, by the way, an idea, the whole idea for the think tank was an idea of our Italian student group. So these guys in Italy, they are amazing. They have a lot of good ideas. Um, and we have an education session. Education is a word play between networking and education. On the 14th, this is for gold members, but we allow a couple of basic members as well. And we will show a little bit of education, which then we will discuss in a working group and then uh, share our findings. Um, and that is on the 14th of October, and the topic is hybrid sales strategies. Cool. That's it. I'm stopping my presentation now. And Nini, I hand over back to you. Thank you, Tessie. This was very, very interesting and eye-opening presentation. I This is already second time I see it, but I find new... I, ideas and new findings every time. So thank you once again. Um, let's go to the questions. We have here a couple of questions. One is coming from Carla um, asking about the organizers um, revenue models here. Carla, would you like to um, maybe present this question directly? I can answer it if um, yeah. oh, okay. maybe Carla has a, a technical problem and I know Carla, yeah. um, I know Carla well. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Everybody is looking for a new revenue model and uh, many people even say, and I would like to challenge our industry on that as well, because many people say you can't earn money with online and many people don't find a way to earn money with online. And my answer to that is, it is exactly and totally wrong. It is, I have a statistic that um, of all B2B marketing budgets, the budgets who are funding exhibition stands, 80% of that budget goes now to online B2B products and only 20% go to offline or on-site B2B products, which means the reality is exactly the other way around. You can earn brilliantly money with B2B, only we cannot do it because we don't have the skills. And that comes directly back to the point of diversity in our teams and to diverse skills. What we don't earn, or and, and, and to give also a little bit the answer, we talk a little bit about this in the education session I just thought, um, but um, two things, why are we struggling so much with earning money with, with online. There are two reasons. Our industry has not many customers and we are used to sell big invoices to these industries. So when we send invoices, there are invoices of 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, sometimes 100,000, sometimes $200,000 for a big show participation at the show with an amazing stand with hundreds of square meters and so on. Online, micropayment methodologies are much, much more important, much more important. Exactly the example I used about Facebook, I spent 50 pounds, I could say tomorrow I spent two pounds, in three days I spent three, uh, 30 pounds, then I spent 1,000 pounds. So flexibility in micropayment is a methodology we haven't understood, but it works extremely well for extremely the same motivation, providing leads. Yeah, and that is exactly 
what we are not skilled in and what we need to build in hybrid uh, tools to, to, to set up these micropayment products where our customers can say, and that would be then actually an amazing offer when we can say, you are an exhibitor, you could spend for seven months 50 pounds per day and then you get a discount on the stand when you come to the show. Would our value proposition not be suddenly much, much better? So that is one thing um, about um, how to earn money and what our industry struggles to understand. The second thing is exclusivity. Exclusivity always works. And when many people think about online, they think about mass communication, mass marketing, mass events. Yeah, I need to have 500 people in my webinar. Otherwise, the webinar is not good. It's also not the right way of thinking. If you do a webinar, I was at a webinar. They had 10 virtual rooms. And in each virtual room, there was one CEO of that industry you normally never have the chance to talk to. And the promise was, um, you can ask the CEO the most annoying question you ever want to ask. Yeah, you can grill him. You can really talk to him. And you can do that not only with one CEO, you can do that with 10 CEOs from the industry. Imagine how great that is. You have the CEO of Siemens, of Mercedes, of BMW, just to pick out some examples. And you get two minutes for the CEO. And they sold the tickets for this virtual event for a lot of money. And it was sold out in half an hour. So micropayment is one first methodology. Truly exclusivity in which we are in a prime prime seat because we have the contact in the industries. We, we are organizing trade shows is the other one. So statement you can't earn money with online is by 100% and utterly wrong. It is, if you say we can't earn money with online, then it's right, but in general you can. Yeah, this was very interesting. I um, Last time when I heard about it, it was eye-opening to see that I kind of understood that if you are an exhibitor, when you come to a trade show, why you go there, you go there to get leads. You want to sell your solution or product or service. And when you have a stand, it depends on how uh, good location you have, how beautiful your stand is, is uh, your message clear? Um, is your staff well-trained and are they getting the right people to step by and to your stand? Uh, but also you need a little bit of luck as well. When there are thousands of visitors that you get the right person to come to the yeah. stand. Yeah. So you can spend that 20,000 euros, let's say, for the stand, but you might uh, walk out with the major leads that will help your business in the future. Yeah. Well, this hybrid event, it gives you a little bit a different approach. If this micro payment way of this Facebook leads, like you were saying, is coming to the trade shows, how I understood is like, as an exhibitor, I can uh, pay for per visitor, directly to the show organizer. I don't spend 20,000 anymore for the space rent. I spend much less, but I don't have this uh, opportunity to get the big fish to come to my stand uh, with the luck, but I just get the, what I pay for. So for the and it's a, that's a very good point. And I'm sure if, if it's true that we move into a hybrid event era, which I believe is true, exhibitors will shift their money they will shift their money in either cases. The question then is only, will they spend the money with our products if we have developed them, or will they spend the money with other people? Like Pop Wine. There are new kids on the block, like Cisco, who do their own hybrid events, who, uh, who are even not connected to a trade show in the hybrid event strategy anymore. Yeah, um, we have a next question here. Uh, they say from Uta. Hi, Tizi. Great to have you, actually. It was fun listening. And yeah, uh, they are, we are sure that hybrid formats and online formats, are, they come to stay and uh, we have to adapt. Uh, and we have to make sure that, that our industry really learns how to, to use these techniques and then sell them to their customers as well. But 
one question I, which is um, a technical question and there I would like to ask you as, as an expert who's in contact with many, many peoples right now. What we are witnessing is on the one hand side, hybrid formats coming from the organizers. Fair enough, matchmaking, uh, conference, whatever. This is the one thing, but the other thing I'm sure is gonna happen is that uh, companies like Cisco exhibiting on a CES or whatever uh, want to stream, to upload, uh, to discuss, to present things online uh, while the show is running. And what I see um, is that our venues are not um, capable to do all these, these um, uploads uh, um, uh, yeah, this, they, they, they don't have the capacity for all these uploads uh, they need. Um, do you see any show grants right now investing into broad uh, uh, cable connections uh, and so on? Or is, are they a little bit dormant at this point? It's, I, I, Uta, you, you're talking about a really, really um, important and complex um, point here because innovation in the industry um, is um, often depending on the player trade show organizer um, because they are the gate holder to the ultimate, ultimate uh, customer to, to, to the exhibitor but very often trade show organizers are not the most innovative um, companies when it comes to digital or known reasons because uh, a so far exhibition was a really good, good, good business yeah, and they were not under pressure like the newspapers 15 years ago to really turn into, into this models. I have done an investigation when it comes to venues um, just before the crisis. Uh, um, how does the venue of the future look like? And um, there were things which are very in conjunction and play a lot with the things I just talked about, hybrid events that the visitor of a trade show in the future, they want, they don't, they don't divide their life in private life and business life anymore. It all happens at the same time. So they need to have a good connection to be in contact with their friends. But they also they come to the trade show, they want to work for one or two hours. So they need a pop-up office space. Um, they don't want to queue at the entrance anymore. They want, don't want to waste time anymore. And that puts a lot of pressure and a lot of opportunities also on the venues to enhance its experience, for example, is a big, big word. A trade show is not about trade only, it's also the experience. So there can be many experience points. And in this investigation I was just talking about, we identified 10, 12 points where a venue could play in a massively important role to make the trade show better by offering hybrid meeting rooms, pop-up office spaces. Um, what we did at UBM, we said entrances at my show at Food Ingredients, we said um, entrances are boring, yeah? Uh, you, you're queuing and you, you, you start your day with a negative uh, half an hour. Why don't you start your day with a positive half an hour? So we did an innovation entrance uh, out of the entrance. We, we made an innovation zone out of the entrance and so on. For the suppliers and for, for your industry, for the stand builders and the suppliers, my strong advice would be don't wait for the venues, don't wait for the trade show organizers, um, because then you, you have a lot of time to wait. Um, come up with innovative products and, and, and offer this. Even start offering it to the exhibitors. I, had, I was consulting three years ago and platform, they were based uh, close to Frankfurt, and they said, hey, we have the best matchmaking platform in the world. Believe me, it's, it's miracle. Yeah? The only problem is we don't have any data. So we are now looking for a trade show organizer. They fill their data in our platform, and then the whole magic comes to life. And I said to them, when I was e-business director at Reed Exhibitions, I had the day five calls saying, hey, I have the best matchmaking platform ever. It's empty, Believe, give me your data and then the whole magic comes to life. I couldn't hear it anymore. I said to them, I even said to them, go to the industry, 
fill it with data from the industry. And when you have the industry data in your platform, I knock at your door. Because then you have your exhibitors or your poten my potential exhibitors will be then in your platform. So everybody who has a good idea for a hybrid event, Cisco is doing it themselves. Everybody who has a good idea for a matchmaking tool, for an online innovation tool, for what Hop Wine is doing, they're doing it also. They don't ask for permission at the trade show organizer. If Hop Wine is knocking the door at the wine show in Bordeaux and said, look what platform I have, Hop, they will engage with them. So it's, it's, it's a hard game we are in because we have three players, venues, exhibition organizers, suppliers, and if we all wait for the other to be active, it no, never anything will happen. So if you have a good idea, do it. Do it and then can't go to the trade show organizer and, and, and offer the idea like Hop Wine. That would be my, my advice uh, for that. It, it, it's hard to overcome it, but I think it's necessary. And I also think we will have a lot of new kids on the block just doing it in the next months to come and they will not ask anybody for teamwork or permission they will just launch their products exactly. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah i was just saying that um there's new kids on the block i heard this um a wine example a week ago and after that i was searching a little bit on linkedin for other a new uh, exhibition formats they are available and there are the industries are um, creating them inside the industries today i joined one called lisa and it's for maritime industrials and they have they had an exhibition going on online so you yeah. could join there as a member and there were exhibitors and all kind of discussions going on and seminars daily happenings this world is changing and it was the world is changing. Yeah. I was in the last month, I was on uh, three art exhibitions and they were done by people who just had an art block. So they had, they had 20,000 followers and they had contacts to good artists and they said, hey, why don't do I do an art exhibition? That would not have been possible a year ago. Um, but still coming back to my point, it, I said, I think at the UFI meeting, I also said when it comes to hybrid events, we are all startups. Yeah, there are no new companies, old companies. We are all new companies when it comes to hybrid events. So we all need to act like startups um, as well a little bit. We need to be agile. We need to try out things. We need to fail. We need to succeed again. We need to have a diverse group of people. And it's, it's, I think there is, this is not a coincidence why this Italian student group and the French student group give so much inspiration in the think tank. This is Imagine a board meeting 10 years ago. How long would a student have been even allowed to talk in a board meeting? That would not happen. Now these guys are sitting in our think tank working groups and really giving us inspiration. So I think it's time to act. And then when we do this, then it's time to go back and say, hold on. We are really in a pole position here because we are the trade show industry, because the end point will always be the face to face. And this is the reason why we can be confident and proud. I'm a big, you, it comes across a little bit maybe, I'm a big ambassador of digital, yeah? <laughs> but I'm also a big ambassador of, of exhibitions. We have an asset in our hands, um, but we need to, 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 to find new ways as well. Yeah, uh, there's a lot to digest, <laughs> a lot of information and new things here, what we heard today. Thank you for educating us and sharing the uh, findings of your survey. This was very interesting. Um, I guess we will continue. There are no more questions here, I see. Uh, we will continue the discussion maybe in other channels within the IFS members. This is something that we need to discuss as our whole business is changing and moving. And um, as uh, Ben is here from Singapore saying to everybody that I believe that members of IFES designers and producers will be in a good position to offer online services to complement physical trade show participation for exhibitors 
I believe so too, and I hope everybody here believes. I believe that so way. too, and I also I think I think in the whole industry also needs to say thank you to the suppliers uh, in in some way, because a lot of ideas, a lot of inspiration, and a lot of service at the end of the day comes from from the supplier side in this uh, triangle. So. Every supplier should be should be confident, and and it's also you play such an important role for the development at the moment, more important than ever. So, also thank you very much that I could be here. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.